Affirmation of the Spirit, Consciousness, Transformation, and the Fourth World in Film by Christopher Slatsky Originally published in Cine Massacre, Volume 1, Issue 3 1. A projector spits dirty light against a torn screen in a rundown Los Angeles theater that screens art films by day, pornos at night. A jumbled Vorkapitch sequence depicts various species being slaughtered by a dozen figures clad in rain gear. The scene is followed by a medium long shot of a man crucified on the slaughterhouse's grime bespattered door. A forward zoom reveals that the body is nailed to the sheet metal with long iron spikes impaling his wrists, ankles, and throat. Hundreds of smaller, thinner silver nails protrude from his naked body in such abundance he could be mistaken for a shining metal sculpture if not for the subtle swaying of his head. The soundtrack consists solely of animals shrieking. Given the amateurish performances, poorly recorded dialogue, and inexpertly framed shots, likely using a Bolex H-16, the audience may be excused for assuming they were watching a snuff film, or more charitably, a clumsily produced amateur movie. But this is the opening scene of The Powdery Man, less commonly titled Film Modi, a little-known experimental art film from 1974, give or take, as the production history is notoriously muddled and mysteriously unverified. The Powdery Man had a brief limited release before passing into obscurity. There were rumors that any existing complete prints were destroyed after the initial showing, but a dozen or so heavily edited bootlegs continued to circulate in collector's circles throughout the 80s and 90s. So rare, the extant copies went for a hefty price if they could be found at all. I myself was only able to view a battered VHS tape, the images obscured by tracking lines and faded from countless recopying. In short, a veritable cult is conglomerated around an obscure, nasty little flick. But a rare few who experienced a screening in that original Los Angeles theater during the summer of 74 insist there was nothing quite like it. And the one person I managed to speak with who retained any memory of their viewing emphatically insists there will never again be anything even remotely like it. But my interest goes beyond a single film. Considering such cinematic trash raises the question of how and why the big screen manages to allow the emotional, intellectual, and spiritual vitality of cinema to be that much more palpable, even with a less-than-Oscar-worthy product. What is the allure of filmed depravity, of viewing violence and dread and discomfort? Is there some innate need to be challenged? Are we actively seeking to threaten and subvert our very moral and spiritual foundations through art? Excluding politics, of every human creation, religion and art rise to the surface as the most contentious. Consequently, why does film seem to be the most magical of the arts? Are film and religion more alike than we realize? Film and religion celebrate as well as condemn the basest of human desires. Both exalt the darkest impulses and grandest accomplishments. There's little controversy in my asserting that religion has brought the world great things as well as atrocities. See Bataille's assertion that the sacred has intimate connections to eroticism, violence, and religion. Film tends to focus on these extremes of the human condition as well. I'm certainly not walking on untrodden ground when I assert similarities between the church and cinema. With faith and art, atavistic acts may become transcendent in their savagery, looping back to approach the illimitable, the dichotomy of the infinite and infinitesimal. The faithful and cineasts have mutual interests, overlapping philosophical and theological inquiries. Both boldly examine the sewers of the human soul in an attempt to find pious or artistic enlightenment. In this, I think there's something new to present. 2. As early as 1910, Minister Herbert Atchison Jump extolled the link between film and religion within his self-published pamphlet, The Religious Possibilities of the Motion Picture. 
The pulpit orators and evangelists use moving pictures in one sense of the term, pictures that move the heart by their thrilling quality. But the picture that literally is moving, that portrays dramatic sequence and lifelike action, possesses tenfold more vividness and becomes therefore a more convincing medium of education. Religion and film have been inexorably linked since the first kinetoscope. There's a dark glamour at the heart of both, a quality that makes them eminently transformative. To watch a movie is to stare into the eye of the cosmos and contemplate infinity. To participate in rituals and listen to a priest ruminate on faith is to go through something similar and to be a different person than you were before entering the sacred space, whether mosque, church, synagogue, all theaters of human creativity. Film and faith are means of inspiring wonder on viewing the illimitable as an impetus for astonishment. We are irrevocably different beings after these liminal journeys. 3. Filmmaker Stan Brackage famously wrote, The stars are the optical nerve endings of the eye which the universe is. I cannot disagree. Filmgoers participate in an activity that began when the first cognitive primate stared into the night sky and marveled at what it could never fully comprehend. That is, to wonder about its position in the world and thus be consumed within the whirlpool of existential angst, or else be motivated to ascend to celebratory optimism. Film is philosophy cloaked in the mantle of literature, shorn of the shackles of live theater. There is an intimate connection between humanity's gaze and the night sky. How many billions of eyes have stared into the heavens? Natural selection has sculpted your vision to adapt to stargazing, and since the movie screen is far too recent an invention to have been shaped by evolutionary pressures, your biology hasn't fully grasped the images splashed in light on the screen. As filmgoers, you are still an ape captivated by stars. Your ancient nature hasn't evolved adequately to comprehend the spectacle of the heavens, so you react with awe at films. This all suggests the medieval pilgrim in a gloomy church interior, dumbstruck at the beauty and ephemeral wonder of stained glass windows, their holy narrative encompassing a vast church wall, vividly illuminated by streaming sunlight. The blazing colors of divinity are a clear analogy to the dark theater's luminous big screen and its spectacle. All it lacks is motion. Upturned faces in rapt attention receiving a narrative, soul-stirring music moving the audience to emotional extremes, both settings ebbing with spiritual grandeur, the actors beautiful beings composed of light projected through celluloid, the deification of thespians, those modern vestiges of the Greek divinities. All-consuming experiences, Religious observances and the cinema envelop you in promises of other worlds beyond the mechanistic, the visceral, this rubbish heap of a world. Both take mortal aging flesh and convert it into ageless columns of dancing light. They offer unreal creatures of fantasy, seraphim on the silver screen that lure you into becoming something different than what you were before entering that sacred space. So, we've arrived at the point where you transform into spectators within cathedrals of light and imagination, observers of terror and bliss in the theater. But analogies between churchgoers and filmgoers can only go so far before one may be accused of stretching a metaphor too far or straining to make connections where they are tenuous at best. I will make one more leap that will likely offend, but which I hope to substantiate. 4. At their root level, religions exist to justify the existence of a soul, or as the secularist contends, a mind. The innate need to distance oneself from the natural world by concocting beliefs that inculcate you with an intangible, immortal aspect is the strongest link religion shares with film. You strenuously resist your bodies, rebel against the prospect that your decomposing forms are all there is, Blanch at the prospect that there's nothing cocooned inside your filthy shell to transcend disgusting flesh. 
religions and art and dreams are all plaintive cries to transform once your body sickens and dilapidates into compost. Psychologist Bertram D. Lewin postulated in the Yearbook of Psychoanalysis journal that, in a previous communication, a special structure, the dream screen was distinguished from the rest of the dream and defined as the blank background upon which the dream picture appears to be projected. The term was suggested by the action pictures because, like the analog in the cinema, the dream screen is either not noted by the dreaming spectator, or it is ignored due to the interest in the pictures and actions that appear on it. Brains have evolved to accommodate this inner screen. The very systems in your head come equipped with a viewing theater, if you will. Film theorist Bruce F. Kawin built upon Lewin's ideas with a concept he termed mind screen. That is, excluding the occasional gimmick, films are overwhelmingly thought of as third person omniscient narratives. But film is more like the dreaming mind in that it becomes a first person thinking being, a self conscious independent thing, estranged from the contributions of any audience's interpretation. As Kawin succinctly puts it, film is a dream, but whose? This obviously raises questions about the nature of the human mind itself. The body-mind problem, or mind-film problem, has generated a vast literature beyond the scope of this essay. Suffice it to say for our purposes that neurophilosophers remain skeptical that a physical brain, and the audience by extension, even possess the potential for consciousness. Again, Kaywin, although a camera does not have consciousness and cannot therefore literally be an eye, it is possible to encode the image in such a way that it gives the impression of being perceived or generated by a consciousness. Although this mind remains off-screen, its existence is implicit and can be integrated into the fiction, with a result that the field is properly termed first person. Human consciousness and the cinematic consciousness work as poetic descriptions and philosophical avenues in which to explore this religious and artistic need to inject a ghost or mind between the molecules of your blood and bone. Like the physical medium of film, human activities, creative expressions, and musings generated from meat-dependent brains also give the impression of being perceived or generated by a consciousness. But minds only work as metaphors for mechanistic processes, and this begs an explanation as to the idea of just what is meant by a film's consciousness. The screenwriter, actors, and director may be the focal point for filmmakers, but a film in its entirety exists as a comprehensive whole, a self-sufficient mind that unveils its imagery and story onto a screen. Consciousness, or a convincing facsimile of such, suffuses the very screen. Granted, a film exists as the holistic work of many, but can safely be boiled down to the screenplay, director, and performers. But the resulting product is an entity unto itself, a distinguished thinking thing unconfined by the strictures of its creators. Film is a mind of photons projected against a screen accompanied by noise, all caught in an endless loop with a beginning, middle, and an end. Descartes famously posited the existence of a world composed of physical bodies and a world of incorporeal mental states. But Karl Popper argued for the existence of a third world, one which is the sum of human minds. I propose that film is the fourth world. Popper also described determinism as a logical progression from this, as a motion picture where the images currently being projected are the present, scenes already viewed were in the past, and those yet to be seen remain in the future. In the film, the future coexists with the past, and the future is fixed in exactly the same sense as the past. Though the spectator may not know the future, every future event without exception might in principle be known with certainty, exactly like the past, since it exists in the same sense in which the past exists. In fact, the future will be known to the producer of the film, to the creator of the world.
If the producer of the film and the very creator of the world know what has been, what is, and what will be, why pretend you've chosen anything in your life? You've no choice, and nothing is under your control. Why bother pursuing your dreams? Have children. Fall in love. Out of love. You're incapable of making decisions. You've crossed this trail previously, and you're condemned to pass over the same ground again and again. You're at the mercy of the fourth world, and everything you have been or will be has already been filmed. 5. Since we've established a fourth world film mind, I ask whether or not the theater-goer is even real. Is there an actual, substantive mind, whether metaphorical or literal, processing the narrative in a film? Or is the viewer an unthinking mannequin reacting to the brightly lit spectacle on the screen in the same manner a plant reacts to photons? What of this? As I type, I am pestered by the notion I may not be a me typing these words. Am I a person with a brain and nervous system in charge of my diction? If so, what in turn is nestled within that brain, dictating its secret diction to my brain, and another mind inside that mind, in infinite regress ultimately concluding in a celestial mind? There must either be a beginning, an uncaused first mind, or no mind at all. Dregs and trash dressed up as angelic beings are still garbage, and we all know what Rilke thought of angels. If humanity truly are automatons, you are relieved of anything other than a reaction based on ages of evolutionary coding stamped into your DNA. Your species is subject to physical laws dictating your behavior as precisely as plants are to phototropic influences. Choice is an illusion, as inescapable and repulsive as semiotician Kristeva postulates. What is the demoniacal? an inescapable, repulsive, and yet nurtured abomination, the fantasy of an archaic force on the near side of separation, unconscious, tempting us to the point of losing our differences, our speech, our life, to the point of aphasia, decay, opprobrium, and death. There is no evidence of reality outside the domino effect of chunks bashing into bits and the resulting physical processes being revered as something other than the mechanistic drudgery they are. Even film, despite its potentially being a thinking thing, may also be caught in the web of the mind-body problem. Free will is nonsense. You or pure material machines, a collateral product of your nervous processes, unable to react upon them any more than a shadow reacts on the steps of the traveler whom it accompanies. Inert, uninfluential, a simple passenger on the voyage of life, it is allowed to remain on board, but not to touch the helm or handle the rigging. Did you notice that your hand is the texture and color of putty? Your every decision has been plotted by Popper's film producer, or, less poetically, unthinking materialistic properties. Regardless, you've no say in any matter, as physical matter says it all for you. Everything inevitably collapses into the scripture of entropy, your every move a biomolecular clockwork spasm, a stopwatch set millennia ago by mindless selective forces, a wind-up doll with bad breath, aching back and a hankering for watching bad movies in dimly lit rooms. There simply is no you to process the sights and sounds from the screen, sluiced through your retinas and dumped into an empty, plastic brain. Now it's perfectly natural for you to question whether you're transforming into a special effects stunt dummy. Evolving into a corpse prop to be dropped from great heights just might be the best application for a useless mannequin like you. This is the logical conclusion of an inert thing acting as if it's conscious. Speaking of mannequins and special effects stunt dummies, and given your lack of a mind and the potential for a consciousness to exist on film only, or fourth world, even those two-dimensional puppets on the screen may be deprived of sentience. Puppets provide an interesting case. No one would mistake them for a real person, yet they aim for a certain kind of naturalism. 
They resemble movie images in respect of ventriloquism. A voice is thrown into the puppet's mouth in much the same way speech appears to emanate from the mouths of those two-dimensional puppets on the screen. The voice is pretty much a normal human voice in both cases, but the apparent source of the voice is a transformed human, large and flat in the one case, small and knobby in the other. The Punch and Judy show is not a million miles away from the film. Patently unreal figures of altered dimensions spouting their lines, or seeming to, both convey a startling animation in the sense that we quickly forget that they are only effigies of real people. They take on a life of their own. And I think that both demonstrate a kinship with the uncanny. They seem to move of their own volition, despite their lack of inner agency. It is uncanny if inanimate objects begin to move as if they had a will of their own, and both puppets and movie images do this. It is as if they were alive, while clearly not being so. The similarities to you are striking, are they not? Pay attention to this scene. This is where the powdery man hovers in the background while a poorly constructed dummy is torn limb from limb by unseen assailants. The effect is cheap, a shoddy effort to produce gouts of gore that are far too red and thin to be real blood. But there is still a sense of the uncanny in viewing such violence against emotionless, insensate plastic. The viewers cannot help but place themselves in the dummy's position, stuffed with rubber viscera and fake fluids and unblinking eyes. Does it really matter what's inside since it's all tactile, free of any wispy souls? You are just an effigy of a real person. Let us return to the film. Jaws warble and mouths clack in laughter at the antics of the powdery man on the big screen. You thrill at the sight of mannequins falling from a gray sky, piling up like cordwood, their dead limbs and artificial smiles still intact. The dialogue is gibberish, but why assume empty-headed things are capable of making sense? When all is said and done, when the end eventually rolls across the universe's screen, your mannequin hands will clap, your glass eyes well up with emotion, and unseen strings will tug you upright. You'll move down the aisle to the lobby, where you'll chat with your fellow cineasts about the screening of the powdery man you just sat through maybe even discuss other trivial ideas. Incessant dummy talk. This is a certainty. It will happen. But for now, good old corpse prop takes in a show. Does it enjoy the movie? Is the narrative entertaining? Do photons bounce against your plastic retinas and send signals to your plastic brain? Is it even possible for you to enjoy a film? to enjoy anything, to be anything. Your script was written ages ago. The storyboards place you precisely where you're destined to be. You cannot deviate from the screenplay. The cameras roll, mouth the banal dialogue. It doesn't matter if you understand what you're saying or not. You're a vessel for a story you had no hand in writing. Existence is in the can. The world is a theater of empty-headed viewers, wanting nothing more than to be like that mind up there on the screen. You yearn to break free of the putrid matter that constitutes your parody of a body. But that's as ridiculous as a shadow dreaming it can exist independent of what casts it. Stand on the X, dummy. You are composed of still shots spooling through a void at 24 frames per second flickering matter frozen in place and artificially manipulated to appear to be cognizant things capable of making decisions. But you are not capable. You don't have the equipment. There is no auteur. But oh, the screen! There is something like a soul revealed when the curtain parts and the blank surface is illuminated. There's nothing as transcendental as film, as transformative as a good movie. The fourth world is glorious indeed. The movie is starting. Of course, it began and ended long ago. Here begins another showing. It's time to watch and be transformed. 6. 
The spirit is so closely linked to the body as a thing that the body never ceases to be haunted, is never a thing except virtually, so much so that if death reduces it to the condition of a thing, the spirit is more present than ever. The body that has betrayed it reveals it more clearly than when it served it. In a sense, the corpse is the most perfect affirmation of the spirit.